answering the phone at the association when people still used phones. <laughs> and people would call up and they'd say, oh, I love food and I love travel. I want to work with you. I want to do something with it. Yeah. And well, who yeah. doesn't love food and travel, right? So that doesn't translate into a career with the association or as a food tour company or anything. You know? Namaste, Eric. Namaste. Welcome to the tourism story. And uh, on this uh, show, we talk, uh, we talk to the tourism professional who have made something out of their life and who are uh, an expert in their field. So it's an honor. It's a pleasure to talk to you. I'm very thankful for your time and I'm very honorable to talk to you. So it's going to be very uh, fun and it's going to be very learning uh, conversation I'm going to have with you. So thank you again. Well, I'm excited to finally speak with you. Let's begin at the beginning. And to tell people about you, I'm going to just give them a one line. So Eric is considered as the father of food tourism. And I want to know from you, people and the world see you as the father of food tourism. How do you see yourself? Wow, I've never been asked that question before. Um, I, I see myself as someone who is leading our industry forward. Having founded the industry almost 20 years ago, I think that we're in a unique position to to continue to lead the industry forward. And I, I would hope that people would look at me as someone who uh, continues to innovate, who strives for excellence in everything that we do, and really to go where no one has gone before. I hate to quote Star Trek here, but I think it's really quite correct in that there seem to be a lot of people out there who are very good at copying and not really innovating. And what we want to do, what I want to do is to continue to innovate and to get our industry to the next level. And it takes time and it takes money and it takes devotion and it takes passion. And I hope that I, I bring that passion to this. And how successful do you think have you been or how much justice are you able to do with your passion? <laughs> well, I, I built the, the association from zero members and zero followers back in 2003. And yeah. this year we're serving close to 200,000 trade professionals in over 150 countries. So that's one metric that you could look at to, to try and gauge the success. But I think, I think really we're making an impact in the tourism industry. There's a reason why the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and so on, get in touch with us. People like yourselves, we're always happy to talk to bloggers and journalists, and really anyone who just needs a little bit of, of career advice. Uh, so yeah, I think I think that's that's it. Yeah, uh, that's great. That's great. I, it's it's really helpful. I've I've read your many articles. I've read your many uh, metrics, and I have used them in my personal PPTs and. Uh, my personal talks, I use them and I refer to your work a lot. I think that's the back, your work, I think, is the backbone in food tourism. So let's talk about you. Let's talk about your childhood. I think you were born in Portland. Is that uh, right? No, I was, I was born in the middle yeah. of the United States, but I lived in Portland longer than anywhere else I have on the planet. So how was your childhood? And tell us about your school. Tell us about your college life while you were <laughs> studying. Well... Growing up in the middle of the United States in the farmland, you can yeah. imagine that we pretty much had steak and corn, and that was it. And yeah. that, I think from a very early childhood, I just something in my genetics knew that this was not enough. You know, getting yellow tomatoes in the wintertime or hard pineapples, things like that, were, were not yeah. tasty to me. And then as as... We, as I got older, my family moved to a bigger city. We moved to Atlanta, and then I moved to bigger cities again. So Washington, D.C., New York, San Francisco. But I also had a chance to live overseas in Sydney and Copenhagen, Singapore. And I think all of this kind of came together to, to make the, the person that I am today. And you studied tourism, I think. I did. I did. I was in the School of International Service at the American University in Washington, D.C., and I did my master's yeah. thesis on tourism as communication. You were teaching in uh, New York University, so would you like to share about that? How was that experience? Sure. Yeah, I, I love to teach. I love to share my knowledge and help to 
help younger people to get better, get more advanced and, and more knowledge in their and their career plans. And I loved teaching at New York University. It was lots of fun. And the only reason I stopped it was because I took the dream job in San Francisco for a com, which I don't know. I, you know, I I should have stayed in New York. I mean, San Francisco was fine, and the job was was nice and all of that. And that's actually what brought me to Singapore as well. But uh, I was as more a New York boy. But anyway, I, I loved it. I loved teaching. I loved the students, and I loved the international aspect of the students. Really, from everywhere in the world, were in the room, and that was that was quite interesting for me. And then I think you were teaching tourism marketing there. Correct. Yes, that's it. Yeah, undergrad. And students. you you wrote uh, a white paper in two thousand one regarding culinary tourism. Please. Please share about it. I think that was the first uh, ever written article or first ever voice in tourism industry talking about culinary tourism. So how did it came into existence? What what was the personal experience behind it? Well, I back to that job in San Francisco. I was working for a dot com yeah. and I suspected a layoff. So I requested to the company to be transferred to their Portland, Oregon office, which is the only other office they had in the United States. And yeah. They said, yep, that's fine. And then three months later, I got laid off. And I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my career. And I, I was looking at where where I had contacts, what I liked, what I, um, what I wanted to do. And it all came back to tourism and food. And I, I saw the words food and tourism next to each other. And yeah. I thought, wow, that's that's it. And I called it culinary tourism at the time because to me food tourism did not sound exciting enough and then i wrote this white paper yeah. culinary tourism a tasty economic proposition and the white paper was really designed to help our industry understand the prospects of food tourism or culinary tourism that it can be a tool for economic development a tool for community development and it was like when i published that paper it was kind of like a bright light went off in the industry and we received hundreds of requests for that white paper. And then it led to the founding of our association just two years later. And ultimately that white yeah. paper became a book and, and so on and so on. And so here we are today. I think that white paper uh, more than book, it became uh, a trend or it became an association or it became a complete industry in itself. Because Indeed. of the white paper. Indeed. Yeah. So, do you remember your first food tour or first food experience you ever took? You went out for the purpose of just eating. Do you remember that experience, your first one? Oh my gosh, that's such a hard question. I've been uh, to so many great meals and so many tours and so many places around the world. I, that yeah. is really hard. I mean, I, I'm more of a self-led guy. So I think before I even took professional food tours, I was doing my own food education. So for example, when I lived in Singapore, when I landed there, and after a 15 hour flight from San Francisco, a connection in Hong Kong, you can imagine you're pretty tired. But the first thing I did was to go to the cold storage grocery store, where I spent two hours walking yeah. around, looking at all of the different wow. foods, the different packaging, the different fruits and vegetables, reading the labels. Um, seeing actually some American products like Tillamook ice cream from Oregon, where I was from, was being sold in Singapore and yeah. being blown away by all of this. And then finally, after two hours, I went back to the hotel and collapsed for 24 hours. <laughs> but but that's that's the kind of person I am. I'm a big food nerd and I, I am always exploring wherever I go. Still today, I explore. Your, your first experience of a professional food too. Wow. Well, I guess probably that was back in 2004 in British Columbia. Wow. We were doing yeah. our first international conference on food tourism in Victoria, British Columbia, which is a beautiful, yeah. beautiful area. And there is a woman there who led um, food and wine tours of Vancouver Island, which is the island off the coast of British Columbia. And she took me and some other people from the conference around and we visited wineries, we visited farms, we visited restaurants. And it was, it was like, it was my Disneyland. You know, other people go to Disneyland <laughs> and they do the rides, yeah. you know, and, and this, was, this was my Disneyland. I, I was doing everything I wanted to do. It was, it was fun for me. I was taking pictures, I was shopping, you know, everything that anyone else would be doing at Disneyland, I was doing on a food tour. 
para puerto wow that's great so uh, how do you start it how how do you start it and what made you start an association in uh, in food tourism because it's a big thing it's a it's a very big thing to start an association and then to run it so what was what was the main motivation behind it i mean you had a job or you were still working in tourism industry or in other industries but starting full time as an association is a big task so what was the motivation behind it well i think it was really the white paper that that justified the business case for doing something more with food yeah. tourism and after yeah. 500 or so requests for the white paper in 2 years which was almost one a day yeah. i i knew that there was something yeah. here so i spoke with a uh, a couple of people in the industry in the, in the tourism industry and we all agreed that it made sense to organize an association so i formed a board of directors and then we we started doing what we do we we really started with education and research which is really our core and ever since our very first day our, we've been focusing on education and research to to help uh professionals advance to understand the value of food tourism and also uh even to help consumers to understand the benefit that of the impact that they have and the choices that they make when they travel so i think it was started in 2003 and it was named as international culinary tourism association yes you've done your research yeah. well done <laughs> thank you and then you renamed it uh, please tell us about it you renamed it to world food travel association so why the change happened well the the change came in 2012 and you're very yeah. right that we started as the international culinary tourism association and yeah. in those 10 years i was paying attention to how people regarded our association what they heard when they heard the name how they reacted to the name and two things were happening people heard international culinary tours they didn't hear the association so they thought i was a tour operator or they they uh, heard the word culinary and then they thought that we were all about the high end gourmet experiences and these were very misleading so we actually did some market research we conducted some surveys and focus groups and the reputation was actually that we were a bit elitist which shocked me because we are not elite yeah. at all but that's the perception it's it's you know what's in a name shakespeare right and when people hear culinary they think gourmet michelin so yeah. we put together a a working group and we came up with a new name and it was funny because we i started with food tourism then i went to culinary tourism and then we came back to food yeah. travel 10 years later and i think the it was easy to do that because by that time food tourism as an industry was already gaining traction so it didn't yeah. need to be called culinary or gastronomy anything it was already yeah. recognized and so it was it was a relatively easy transition we can conclude by this that your well, name is important and the name you are giving your association your organization can really change the perspective of the people because obviously culinary is uh, assumed to be an elite or a posh kind of uh, work and then food is about uh, everything every food street food and then big restaurant so do you face this kind of problem when you talk about culinary or when you talk about food people assume that you're going to talk about restaurants only and then you will not talk about street food or something like this yes the the misperceptions still continue we are educating people every day about what food tourism is and we've tried to make it pretty clear on our website what the differences are between uh the terms culinary tourism and gastronomy tourism what they mean where they are used and and really it it comes down a, a bit to personal preference and also when people are translating the idea of food tourism from their own languages so yeah. for example in europe gastronomy tourism tends to be understood better especially in languages like spanish french italian even greek uh it just translates better but to say food tourism in a language like german it almost sounds like a caveman going hunting you know it sounds it sounds very basic and and almost like I animals agree. going on a hunt so so it really depends on the specific area but you know even even today we continue to find the need to educate people there's many people 
who come into their careers brand new. Maybe they're just out of college, yeah. maybe they're changing careers, or maybe they got promoted into a position where it didn't matter before what food tourism was, yeah. but now they need to know that it's an important what niche. And we continue to innovate uh, by, or sorry, we continue to educate and explain this to people and we provide tools. So there's all kinds of um, documents and downloads and information on our website to help people understand what we mean. Yeah, yeah. So you are starting an association. Uh, what were the problems you, you most, the uh, main problems you faced while starting and then running the association? Well, I think in the early days, one of the biggest problems was people understanding what food tourism was, that it was really more about the culinary cultures and why people travel for it and not about it being something elite or on the other end of it, not being about farm tourism, agritourism. That was yeah. the other misconception. You know, you'd say, oh, I, we run the, the International Culinary Tourism Association. Oh, do you, you do farm tours or yeah. <laughs> you go to gourmet restaurants or, you know, so, so that was one of the hardest things in the early days. And I think another hard thing has always been the, the search for funding. So it's very, so even though we're classified as a nonprofit organization in the United States, we are not doing heart, heart, uh, research or children's cancer programs or anything like that. So yeah. the type of funding that's available for nonprofits in the United States is, is not very good. You have to be doing either an arts and culture thing. So like symphony, or you have to be helping the homeless people, or you ha have to be helping uh, a child in need, something like that. And then yeah. if you are doing any of those in the United States, funding is available. But if you're doing something that's more about culinary culture or uh, this, the type of things that we do, there's money for it in places like Canada and Europe, but not in the United States. So, you know, we've had to, to really work at diversifying our product portfolio and our revenue stream. So we do a lot of different things. And in the end, it all comes together and, and works. But I would say that you know, starting starting a business, even a nonprofit, is is hard. It takes money, it takes people, it takes time. Yeah. And having access to sufficient funding is is it's always a challenge. You know, even today, twenty years later, we're always looking for new ways to diversify our income stream. And I think that yeah. having moved to Europe a couple of years ago, I moved for family, and we're in the process of establishing an NGO in Spain as well. And I think this has been a really beneficial move for the association because we are in an area now where people understand cuisine, gastronomy, why people travel for it, why it's important. And they do so in a way that I think is very different than the United States. Americans do like food, but they don't have as much of a food history as, as they do in Europe. Yeah. You know, the, the culture here, the culinary culture is thousands of years old, but, but really, if you're talking about cuisine in Europe, it's more like six, seven, 800, 900 years old. But in the United States, nothing is more than 200, 250 years old. And <laughs> yeah, not have, even the monuments. No, not even. And you do have a lot of really <laughs> interesting immigrant influences in the food in the United States, yeah. which is probably the, the best strength of the cuisine in the US. Yeah. But it's, it's a very different perspective. And it's more like people um, live to eat in Europe and they eat to live in the United States, if I can make such a <laughs> yeah. gross generalization. Yeah, that's that's cool. The last time was really cool. So uh, I will take three main points out of it. The first one is perception that how people are perceiving you, your brand name or what you're trying to do. You need to make them understand what you are trying to do, I think. And that's every time you need to tell them that, oh, it's not this, it's that. And the second challenge was uh, fund. Uh, you need to raise money. And the third thing was looking at your market or looking at the target audience. You uh, you want to talk to. So would you like to share any incident that how you ov overcome a particular challenge, be it funding, be it uh, your perception or be it the market, anything that's, that can help us understand more? One thing that we noticed in the evolution of our industry was that people tended to put all food lovers in a group together. And they yeah. said, oh, you're a foodie. 
And a lot of people who are food lovers hate that term. They think it's pretentious and they don't yeah. like to be considered a foodie. They, they want to be called a food lover. And that was very interesting to see these developments happening. And also the misperception by, by many other people who, are, who still love food, but they talked about yeah. those people those people who are foodies. Well, no, you enjoyed the restaurant we went to. You make a big deal of finding the right restaurants or the right experiences, the right wines when, when you travel. So you're, you're a foodie too, right? No, no, I'm not a foodie. And so this was a, a big deal. And we actually did research on this in 2010. And we, well, this was 20, 2009 actually, the research came out in 2010. And what we discovered was that there was different kinds of food lover behaviors. And we originally started with something like 21 different profiles, and we finally consolidated them down to 13 profiles, which we call psychoculinary profiling. And what yeah. it means is how people make their decisions regarding food and drink. And some of the psychoculinary profiles are things like authentic, organic, eclectic, innovative, vegetarian, and so on. And so yeah. when we discovered this phenomenon, it was like the light bulb went off. And we try to, well, this is this has been part of our research ever since that date in 2010. So it's it's a very, very important part of everything that we do, everything we talk about. When we work with destinations, when we do their culinary placemaking strategies, this is an important part of that as well, because the destinations have food profiles too. So so and one of the biggest mistakes that destination marketers make is to market to all food lovers or foodies you know come to our town we've got we've got authentic this and and local that and actually it was this last research that came out in 2020 that we discovered that local and authentic are now they're marketing noise they're no longer valuable marketing terms to food lovers because everyone is using them and there's no one who yeah. is actually qualifying the use of those terms so what marketers destination marketers especially need to do is to hone in on the type of food lover you are so is someone authentic is someone vegetarian or are they organic are they um, ambiance and then customize your marketing messages based on those um, psychographic traits. So that was that was a huge change in our industry, and I hope that we've we've brought enough awareness of that. It's it's again it's it's an ongoing education thing to to help people un to understand. But I think once we give an example, then then people typically do understand. Yes, I was reading about it. It is really helpful. And then I, I did tours, and I could relate to few of those traits that uh, those tours were those tourists will fall into this category and I could uh, relate to a few of those traits. So I think that that's going to be a huge uh, success and helpful for the uh, businesses as well to understand yeah. the kind of type of tourists coming to them. I think you can ask a few questions to the tourists and then you can customize the whole tour according exactly. to their personality. I think we can use it uh, like that. Exactly. So let's move ahead and before this pandemic, what were what was the thing that you were struggling with in your life and your work? Personally or professionally? Uh, let's do it both, if you can share. Well, I think personally, it's hard living in the UK. I, I live just outside London, and it's hard trying to create an NGO in Spain in another country with other board members. And the Spanish government moves at the speed of molasses. So <laughs> things are not, ha so it took about a year for the company to, be, to allow to be incorporated in Spain as an NGO. And then you have yeah. to get the VAT number. And so that the VAT application went in, I think in January and, and we're still waiting on it in July, you know. So this entire process has been going on for 18 months. And Whoa, you could wow. imagine that to found a company and get set up in 18 months is just shocking. I mean, I could I could go to a US state uh, business registration website, have a company, have a tax ID name, and have everything ready to go in less than 30 minutes. And wow. we're now into 18 months in Spain. So that's been a little challenging, both personally and professionally, <laughs> and trying to straddle both countries, really. Yeah. That's a very big challenge. I mean, 30, 30, 30 minutes and then 80 months is uh, a different world. 
Well, you That's know, a big challenge you're facing. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I don't like to criticize cultures, but I think if, if a yeah. country wants to be competitive, they have to do a lot of things to, to be that way. They have to have a, a competitive tax rate, for example. They have to move things along yeah. quickly and you can't have government bureaucracy. And yeah. I think in a lot of the European countries in general, bureaucracy is done really well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let's move to the future and what are your future goals and what do you want to achieve by the work you are doing? Well, what is that thing you want to achieve? Future goals, uh, once the Spanish NGO finally gets started, the plan is to move yeah. to Spain and to have an office with an international team where we are it's like a think tank for food and beverage tourism, where we are thinking about things that will drive the industry forward. So product development, marketing, strategy, operational issues, anything that will help to drive our industry forward. And that's that's the plan, that's the goal. And we'll, we'll see how things happen uh, as the pandemic unfolds. You know, is this a two year, three year commitment or is this gonna be solved in three to six months? So still, what is that thing you want to achieve by the work you are doing? There might be something you want to achieve yourself by the kind of work you are doing. You have put, I think, 20, more than 20 years of your life in this industry. And what do you want to achieve by this hard work you are doing? Well, I think the, the end game is to help to preserve and promote culinary cultures. And we're doing that through awareness of, of hospitality and tourism. So. Yeah. That's that's exactly it. It I think ever since I was much younger, what really upset me as a, a younger person was to see that so many fantastic food things from my childhood were being erased, forgotten. You know, people oh, yeah. today don't even know how to cook many times. And I think yeah. if you could even say that the pandemic has had, uh, you know, in every cloud there's a silver lining. Well, one of the, the small benefits of the pandemic is that people have had to go start cooking at home more. And they have yeah. been consulting cookbooks. They've been talking to their family for recipes. So that, in, its, in a way, is, is great because it's helping to preserve the culinary cultures. But I think one of the saddest things would be is if I, when I die, that the entire world is eating the same food. So if you want a pizza... Oh, uh -huh. It's Pizza Hut. If you want coffee, Starbucks is on every corner of the planet. And yeah. that's, you know, we don't want to lose our culinary cultures because that's one of the culture is the one thing, whether it's music or architecture or song or clothing or food. Yeah. It's the one thing that that makes us unique from where we are. Yeah, true, true. I agree with that. So you want to break the chain of uh, uh, brands moving across the world or just seeing one kind of food, eating one kind, one kind of food across the world? I guess, I, I think I would probably say more, I want to prevent the globalization of all food. Oh, food. I, I think yeah. that there is a role for chains to play. Uh, chains have some benefits, for example, a consistent pricing. They have a consistent menu that people can identify with or whether it's um, health yeah. and safety or you know, anything like that. Um, so that's, those are some of the benefits of chains, but, but at the end of the day, chains need to respect their distance and they need to know their place. And when they start to come in and aggressively take over a destination, it's like a, a kudzu vine or a bad ivy that comes in and starts to take over everything and, and yeah. strangle it out. And that's, that's what I have an issue with, you know, fine, open up your, your chain coffee or your chain hamburger, keep it over there, but do not start doing predatory marketing or doing things to, or undercutting to close out the smaller businesses. That's, that's what I have the issue with. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a very big thing. I mean, even we are facing the same thing in India, but I think at the same, uh, and I would prefer to go to a local restaurant than to a brand. Uh, I would 99 per 99 times I would prefer to go to a local brand rather than being but you see brand. you're preaching to the choir I agree with you but there are so many people yeah. out there in the world that even e say well using the United States as an example people who live in rural areas their yeah. idea of excitement is to drive to the big city and eat at a chain what, whatever wow. the chain is it doesn't matter but they drive two hours they do their shopping and they eat at 
Olive Garden or um, you know TGI Fridays or whatever it is they eat at these and that they they enjoy that and that's that's great for them, but they have a different reality. They they have different values and different likes and goals, and so you and yeah. I also have different likes and goals. And so yeah. it's you got to have something for everyone, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So let's give something to the young people. Uh, somebody who's starting their career in tourism industry, somebody who's somebody who wants to enter enter the food tourism industry. What advice, what suggestion would you like to offer to them? Skills or stuff they should learn or anything you would like to share? Please do that. Please tell tell us what we can do at the beginning. Well, I think the biggest thing that someone can do is to find the right mentor. So not just to find a yeah. mentor, because there are a lot of people in business that maybe don't have the right mindset to help younger people. So to find the right mentor that can impart their knowledge and experience to someone much younger. I try to do that with my team here at the association because I realize that yeah. one day I'm gonna retire and then one day I'm gonna be dead. And so what happens then, right? <laughs> So I have to create this legacy and the legacy is the association, but really it's how we do things. It's our, our knowledge. It's our institutional memory. All of those things yeah. must be carried forward. So the best thing that I think a younger person can do is to find the right mentor. But I think the best thing that a business professional can do, an experienced one, is to share their knowledge and to do so in a way that the younger people can, can learn and benefit and grow. Any particular skill you think they should have at the beginning or they should at least start with these kind of skills that just to start their career or to kickstart their career and to get an edge uh, yeah. ahead in their life? There's a couple a couple things that I think are really important. Um, and I know that, that you're speaking yeah. to an international audience. So the first thing I would say is to be able to yeah. speak and write English well. And I know that I'm not being an... Yeah. Um, and American centric, this is not, you know, I'm not focusing on the US and saying that you have to speak English like, like someone might think in an arrogant way. But English is the international language of business and tourism. And yeah, yeah, you have to speak English and do so pretty well to to get ahead, not just in your local area, but internationally as well. And if you can yeah. speak English pretty well, then you're going to go so much further than everyone else. And then the second thing I think I would say is for you to, for people to get experience in sales. In everything we do in life is about selling. You sell yourself to an employer. Yeah. You know, you sell your skills, you sell your personality, yeah. you sell how you look, you sell how you behave. Everything is in sales. And I think you, you need to be, learn how to be a little bit of an actor. And you also need to learn how to close a sale. And, and so you can be passionate, yeah. you can love what you could do, you, you can love giving tours or working in a hotel, but if you can't convert that into progress, then you're just a hamster in the wheel. And so if you do want yeah. to get ahead in your career, you need to learn how to innovate and make money with what you do and how to drive your own career forward. Wow, that's great. And what about the research work uh, one should do before they they start their career or if they want to move into food tourism? Should they, should they do some research or should they continue doing that research throughout their life or throughout their career? Should they keep reading? And what, what, what about education that one should keep gaining? I think that's what you are doing. You are working in education. So should we stay connected to the education or it is just a uh, once in a year pro program kind of thing, or just don't do anything. What what are your views? Um, I think we we never stop learning. Yeah. We, you know, I'm I'm in my fifties now, and I learn something new every day. And that sounds cliche to say, but it's true. I'm always learning something new, whether it's something I see on TV, yeah. or talking to a colleague, or a paper or something that comes into my um, inbox. Every day I learn yeah. something new, and I think that you have to to really excel at what you do, you have to be open to continual learning, continual process of improvement, to 
have a feeling that I don't have time for this, or I'm not going to read that email, or I'm not going to read this PDF, or I'm not going to attend that webinar, that's really kind of an ignorant approach. Okay, if you're yeah. busy that week, fine, but don't just categorically state, no, I, I don't read PDFs, I don't download PDFs, I don't read research, I don't attend webinars. That is the biggest shooting yourself in the foot move that you could make. You have to continue yeah. to learn because if you rest on your laurels, if you never innovate, if you never evolve, then everyone else will pass you by. Yeah. And there's one last question. If, if there is an, there's an advice you want to give uh, for food tourism industry in the pandemic, just one thing, what would it be? Be calm, be patient, and hope. That's cute. We, we, <laughs> yeah. we did some research with our community back in yeah. May. So the pandemic was about two or three months uh, into it by then. And we asked yeah. them what their plans were because everyone was, was basically saying, oh, the sky is falling. You know, we're gonna shut down. We're not just gonna close temporarily. We're shutting forever. That's it, we're done, you know? And all of these dramatic yeah. statements that you heard in the press and we thought, wow, is this really happening? So we surveyed our community and discovered that there's only 10% of the respondents said they were either going to absolutely shut down permanently or they strongly would shut down. So 10% okay. out of all the members is not a huge number. And um, no, no, no. really when you think about it, are there maybe too many restaurants, too many food tours, too many breweries and wineries. And so if the world loses 10%, is that such a bad thing? And and I came to that thinking by listening to other professionals who said, you know, there's a lot of people actually who should not be in business for themselves. They don't know how to run a business. They don't know how to make money. They yeah. don't know how to do marketing. So So if the world loses some of these businesses, not a lot, but just a small amount, is it that bad? And I have, we've trained almost a thousand people in the Certified Culinary Travel Professional Program uh, until we changed it into a new product in 2018. And of yeah. those thousand people, I can tell you there are some people who should not be in food tours. Absolutely, there are, there are, they should go into a different career. They should either go into research right? Or they should be a blogger or something else, but they should not be in food tours. Now, I, you know, I, I try to, I, I do counsel a lot of younger people. We work with a, a an army of interns. Uh, we've got seven interns yeah. going on right now. So don't ask wow. me how, that, how that's happening. But, but um, when I mentor younger people or people who are doing career changes, um, it is, I try to put them into the right path. So if someone doesn't have the right personality to do a food tour or be a tourist guide, I try to suggest to them politely that maybe maybe they should go into hotel management, for example, yeah. right? Or something else, something that might be um, more suitable for them. That was always the, the cornerstone of our certification program was to give people career advice. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, maybe if, if someone is in a company that's not doing so well right now, uh, my heart goes out to you, you know, we're, we're all suffering, but maybe it's time to, I'm not going to use the word pivot because everyone else is, but maybe it's time to simply change what you're doing. Maybe yeah. food is your hobby, it's your passion, but maybe it's not your career. And maybe some people need to, to get different jobs. Um, but if you are doing well, uh, or if you were doing well in food tourism and you're suffering that financial hardship right now, I would say be patient, try to do what you can to stay afloat, diversify. You've seen what some companies have done now to, to diversify their product portfolio. And maybe you do need to, yeah. to have a part-time job to bring in income right now until things normalize. But don't give up because one day, whether it's in six months or 16 months, it, this is gonna be done and people are traveling again. I mean, look, the Spanish flu in 1918, right? This is 102 years later and people were traveling just fine two years yeah. ago. So we'll be back there. Yeah. We will. Uh, continuing to do the same thing, if you would like to suggest, uh, because I meet a lot of people, young, uh, young professionals who are students, 
and who come to me and tell me that they love food they want to be a foodie they were they are a foodie they want to be a food tour guide they want to start their food tour company so what analysis should they do uh, on themselves because i think just like you are saying not everybody is fit for being a food guide or fit to have a food tour organization what analysis do you suggest they should do the basic things they should look into themselves or uh, what should they do uh, just to get the analysis that they can do it or not or if they are fit it or, or not well um it goes back to one of my comments before to find the right mentor yeah. so i i think 100% of people i have met say that they love food and travel and in fact yeah. there is a point actually when we were answering the phone at the association when people still used phones <laughs> and people would call up and they'd say oh i love food and i love travel i want to work with you i want to do something with it yeah. and well who yeah. doesn't love food and travel right so that doesn't translate into a career with the association or as a food tour company or anything you know so yeah. you have to to get beyond your passion and realize that this is a business it's not it's not a hobby if it's a hobby then fine you know you give one food tour a month to friends or something and and that's that's enough yeah. but otherwise this is a business and you need to treat it as such so working for yourself is extremely hard you have so many things to to think about and i think that a lot of younger people think that it's going to be you know oh I, there's no office i don't have to pay rent yeah. i don't even need to register the business i can just kind of have a website and people will come well yeah but you won't really go far with that approach and so yeah. get the advice from the right mentor talk to people who are older who have more world experience and get their take on things because they might actually give you a really good idea that's completely different than what you were thinking about. So just because yeah. you love food and travel does not translate into a career in food tourism. You need to, like I was saying before, figure out a way to, to turn this into a business, to make money and to also offer something unique because I think there are so many copycats in the world um, we interviewed a food tour company in Vietnam, and he was the first company to really do food tours in Vietnam. And he said, the moment I launched my website, there were about a thousand other food tours all of a sudden. You know, within three months, there were a thousand websites. Yeah. And he, he said a thousand, and he, yeah. was, he was speaking literally. Everyone thought this was a great idea. All you need to do is put yeah. up a website, right? And so that's not... That's not the way to do it. I mean, and I think about all those tourists that fall for that. You know, they see a pretty website and then they go on the tour and the tour company doesn't have insurance. They don't know about health and safety. Uh, maybe someone gets sick because they took them to a place where they don't have great food hygiene ratings. Um, maybe there's an accident on a moped or something and what happens. And, you know, there's there's consumers, I think, also need to do their due diligence on who they're choosing to travel with. So I think yeah. maybe I'll just leave it there because this could open up another can of worms that we need another hour oh, yeah. for. Yeah, because I, I was about to ask more questions and then I think we should stop here. Let's make it, uh, let's end it here. So we can talk again. I'm sure we, you will give me some time again to talk about food tourism particularly. Sure. So I would like to thank you and thanks a lot. That was a very big learning for me. And I'm sure it's going to be a big learning for the students and the professionals. At least I'm connected be connected with. They're going to find it very valuable, Eric. I'm, I can guarantee you that. A few things. Uh, the, the questions I asked you, definitely they wanted to hear the answer. So thank you a lot for sharing this. It has been a very big deal for me and for other, other professionals as well. My so pleasure. Thank you for the time. And I hope to see you. Please tell us how can everybody find you and connect with you. Uh, the best way is just to visit our website, worldfoodtravel.org, or you can also find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Great, great. So thank you. I wish you best of luck and hope to see you again. Thank you, Ashwani. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.